Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, October the 3rd, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, InfoWars prepares for the devastating WikiLeaks press conference that, according to Julian Assange, will end Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. We will be covering the event live tonight at 2 a.m. Central. But first, a look at Bill Clinton's mixed-race son, who's been banished by Hillary and totally abandoned by the deadbeat president. My name is Danny Williams, and I was uh, giving a little bit around for my followers. I want to thank y'all for supporting me and following me, and I am real. I am Danny Williams. Thank you. Plus, Alex Jones is wrong. Obamacare is awesome. Well, at least the elite thinks so. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, tonight may be the long-promised October surprise from WikiLeaks. Julian Assange has talked about this for a long time. Tonight there will be a press conference. We'll be covering it live with Alex Jones and the rest of the InfoWars crew. It'll be at 2 a.m. Central Time tonight. This is going to be historic live coverage. And again, as we look at the interest in this, it is the top Google trend. That's an article we have at Infowars.com. And people are asking, what could WikiLeaks have on Hillary Clinton? That's the top trend on Google. We captured that. It's an uh, article that's linked by uh, Matt Drudge. And as we point out in the article, Assange said, we have upcoming leaks in relation to Hillary Clinton. He told that to Britain's ITV. He said, we've accumulated a lot of material about Hillary Clinton, <laughs> we all have, uh, but they've got <laughs> a lot of documents that they're going to show, I'm sure, at some point. Tonight, we believe it's going to be it. He says, we could proceed to an indictment. Now, early last month, we point out in an interview with Fox News' Sean Hannity, Assange stated that the long-awaited leaks were imminent, leading many to believe that the information on Clinton would be released tonight. And again, he was originally going to deliver the remarks from the balcony at the Ecuadorian embassy. And if you see the pictures of that balcony that Matt Drudge had up on the Drudge Report, it's a very low-level balcony. There you can see that it's just uh, above the uh, heads of the people standing at street level, a various, very dangerous thing for him to do. So they have uh, declined to do that now. They're going to be doing a telecast, and we will be covering that tonight live at 2 a.m. Central. I want to take a moment and look at the pattern of deception and misdirection that we've seen from the Clintons in the last week, beginning with the debate last week. What is emerging even today as we see the new news about, Hillary, about uh, Bill Clinton's love child from decades ago? What is emerging is really, I guess you could call it a, a tale of sex lies and document leaks. Uh, trying to just show people who the Clintons really are. And when I saw this report that we had about a week ago after the event, uh, the, the, the debate last Tuesday. Took a couple of days, but people said, you know, I noticed that there was uh, a lot of unusual and repeating hand signals it appeared to be from Hillary Clinton, you know, touching her nose and a, a corresponding response from Lester Holt when she would do that. They documented that. They showed it to a poker player, a professional poker player, and he goes, oh, that's very common. Reminded me of The Sting. Take a look at the end of The Sting trailer, that movie from 1974, Paul Newman and uh, Robert Redford. Here's that clip. Paul Newman and Robert Redford. <laughs> you can see they're doing it with the nose. This time, they might get away with it. Yeah, this time, they might get away with it. Who knows? They might. Take a look at the montage that was put together. And this is uh, several GIFs that are in parallel showing the different signals that Hillary Clinton did. Run that tape there and, and take a look at the uh, Hillary Clinton montage. Yeah, that's a, the Clinton sting, isn't it? <laughs> and if you watch the video, you can find it several sources on YouTube. They show how she does these hand signals, and then right after that, you see the response from Lester Holt that gives her precisely what she wants. And of course, as you look at this debate, she even had some concealed carry on the back as she bends over. Look at that. Right there, you can see some wires as well as some kind of a device on her back. What is that? Is that a communication device? Is it a medical device? We don't know. That's the kind of things that the Clintons do. And think about the fact of how they use misdirection. Look at what they did this last week with Cuba, for example. 
You know, we have the oh, we have the State Department under Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. They're laundering money for the Iranians. One point seven billion dollars, foreign currency, secret flights from Switzerland to Iran, which Obama himself declared to be a terrorist state. That was a violation of not only sanctions, but it was a criminal felony to send money to states that are designated as terrorists. They did it with plane loads full of foreign cash. So how does she misdirect people away from that? Well, she concocts a story saying, well, you know, there was somebody that worked for somebody that worked for somebody for Donald Trump that went to Cuba and he reimbursed his company and they paid them like $68,000. And so I think he was trying to get around the embargo. Very different. <laughs> Tens of thousands of times different in terms of quantity. And an absolute, uh, as they pointed out on Hot Air, this is like Bernie Madoff complaining about getting bad investment advice. Not only is the magnitude of this different, but it's a felony versus, uh, it's not a felony versus what Hillary Clinton did. And of course, as we see her doing that, we have to understand that it was Hillary herself and Obama, this, her State Department and Obama, that took away the embargo. Trying to get votes in Cuba for people, you're the ones who took away the embargo. Furthermore, Terry McAuliffe, close Clinton advisor, the guy who ran Hillary's 2008 campaign, the guy who ran Bill Clinton's re-election campaign, the guy who was the Debbie Wasserman Schultz for them in the middle. Okay, He was head of the DNC. This guy directly went to Cuba to try to drum up some business as they were pulling off the uh, the sanctions there. And he is now governor of Virginia, register, trying to get felons to vote. And we see massive voter fraud going on in terms of registration in Virginia as well. But it's also things like taxes. Look at the way she has misdirected us on taxes. Donald Trump offers us hope. He offers us hope of a simplified tax system. With lower taxes, what does Hillary Clinton do? She responds with a policy of envy. And I think nothing uh, says that more than if you look at this article that came out in July when it looked at the tax plans of Hillary versus Donald Trump. And I want you to take a look at how it affects everybody. At bottom line, here's a, here's a spoiler. Everybody's taxes go up under Hillary Clinton. And everybody's taxes go down with Donald Trump. How do you fight that? Well, you fight that with envy. That has always been the way the Democrats have been able to increase taxes. You say to people, well, uh, you're making a, a third of this uh, person over here. If we uh, you know, change the taxes, if we lower taxes, they're going to get three times more money saved than you do, You know, because it's percentages. Not only that, but the, ta the rich are taxed at a higher percentage. So even though you have those types of situations, they always play the envy game. But what they do is they try to misdirect you to Donald Trump's taxes. Understand that if he had a loss, and whether it was a loss in a business that failed or whether it was a loss with a lawsuit against somebody who did not perform and he did not get that money, had to take it over a 20-year period of time, that is no more wrong than if you, are to take, if you take a mortgage deduction for your home. It's essentially the same thing. But they try to sell this as a policy of envy. Real quickly, let's take a look at what they want to do. Donald Trump wants to lower taxes the most of any president we've seen, more than JFK. And that was a big boon to the economy, as JFK said. A rising tide lifts all boats. That was the kind of Democrat that JFK was. Ronald Reagan came along, and he, ra he lowered taxes for everybody and simplified the rates. Hillary Clinton wants to raise the rates and keep it as complicated, actually more complicated. The rates that Donald Trump is proposing is 0% for people who are single with an income of $25,000 or less, 0%. That's the first bracket. The next bracket is 12%. Those making up to $75,000. Those between $75,225, 25%. Those at $225,000 and more, 33%. You see, that's not good enough for those who focus on the politics of envy. Also, the death tax that she is so proud of, 65%. The highest tax rate that any candidate has ever proposed uh, since Ronald Reagan. And she even bragged it was a Freudian slip. She said, I'm going to raise taxes on the middle class. Remember when she said that? Now, a lot of people have said, well, 65%, that's the highest rate on the death taxes. The highest rate on death taxes right now is 40%. The lowest death tax rate under Hillary Clinton would be 45%. If you have a family business 
if you have a family farm? Are you going to be able to hire lawyers to contest the evaluation of the IRS that forces you to liquidate at fire sell prices so you can pay the IRS these taxes at death? when you've been paying massive amounts of taxes all along. Let's take a quick look at the different uh, groups here that Time Magazine broke this down. First of all, the working poor, those making between 25000 and 45000 average of 35000 they would have a tax savings each year. If you make between twenty five and 45000 an average tax savings of about $1,000. And understand that over four years, that's going to add up to about $4,000 what they call the solid middle. That'd be people making between forty-five and eighty-one thousand dollars. Those people would save each year, each year, twenty-seven hundred and seventy-six dollars. Over four years of a presidential term with a President Trump, you would save eleven thousand one hundred and four dollars versus a President Clinton. The upper middle class, those making between eighty-one thousand and one hundred and forty-three thousand. The first year, you would say, each year, you would save $5,512 with Trump as president versus Hillary Clinton. Over four years, those people would pay $22,000 more if Clinton is president. Finally, the well-to-do, those making between one hundred forty-three dollars and $209,000, $7,977 each year. So they would save about $32,000 over a four-year period. But look at who really would uh, see the biggest change here, and that is Uncle Sam. As they point out, they look at Uncle Sam. How would Uncle Sam fare under these different tax plans? Well, you'd have $575 billion difference each year between Hillary and Donald Trump. That's $2.3 trillion over four years. Do you really want to take money out of the economy? Do you really want to take money out of your budget and then give it to the government and have them hand it back to you as a child on an allowance if they give it back to you at all? They'll be giving it back to their cronies, to their friends. That's the true way that this is going to break down. But, you know, when I looked at this misdirection from the sting and the hand signals that she's giving Lester Holt and the idea that she might get away with it, in a sense, you almost have to admire the masterful misdirection of the Clintons. And I thought about the DNC when uh, Bill Clinton got up. He had a very tough sell. He had to sell people on Hillary Clinton and his relationship. He had to sound like father knows best. We have this strong relationship that's gone back for decades. See, we're still together. He doesn't mention any of the affairs. He doesn't mention any of the sexual assaults. No, no problems at all like that. Doesn't mention his illegitimate son. Doesn't mention any of that stuff. And I thought, wow, that's, he, he's got a tough job to do it. If you notice, when he first came out, the way that he warmed up to this, is he started talking about this girl that he saw. He saw her across the way. I want to play this for you here in just a moment. And it kind of reminded me of The Sting. You know, in The Sting, you got Paul Newman, who's the mastermind of it. And you've got uh, the character that's played by Robert Redford. Uh, they call him Hooker because he is infatuated with women. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I guess Bill Clinton would be the hooker of the uh, two because he can't uh, control himself around women. He's not, only a, he's not only a drug user, but this guy is addicted to sex and not even consensual sex. He is a hedonist. He has a moral failing. But, of course, the people in America today see that not as a character flaw. They don't see that as disqualifying somebody for leadership. And I want you to take a look at this. I put some uh, music in the background here from the sting here so you can hear what this guy uh, is really about. And he's projecting, I think, his predatory nature and talking about how it's his relationship with Hillary Clinton. Here's that clip. She exuded this sense of strength and self-possession that I found magnetic. After the class, I followed her out, intending to introduce myself. I got close enough to touch her back, <laughs> but I couldn't do it. Somehow I knew this would not be just another tap on the shoulder. I might be starting something I couldn't stop. Yeah, he might be starting something he couldn't stop. He does have a problem controlling himself. Today, the decades-old story about Bill Clinton's love child that he had with a, a black sex worker has resurfaced again. And the question is, is this really going to hurt the Clintons, or are they going to be able to spin this one around again? You know, Joe Biggs has been trying to talk to this guy. Danny Williams is the uh, young man who's now grown up. 
been trying to uh, talk to him for a while, and he knows, uh, he, he has this guy's uh, social media sites. He took a look at it, but this guy, I'm not really sure how this is going to work out. He now calls himself Danny Williams Clinton, and if you look at his site, it's all about Black Lives Matter. Hashtag Black Lives Matter, hashtag BLM. He has a photo at the top of uh, BLM. And when I look at this, I'm very concerned that this is going to shift the narrative from rape to consensual sex, because this was a consensual relationship that he had the out-of-wedlock uh, son with. That's exactly what they did with Monica Lewinsky. They focused on Monica Lewinsky and let him get away with the rapes that he committed against people like Juanita Broderick, who, by the way, is only is a, is, was a year younger than Chelsea Clinton is today. Let's, let's not worry about hurting Chelsea Clinton's feelings to find out that her father is a sexual predator, a sexual criminal. I think it also shores up Hillary Clinton's street creds with the black uh, groups that would vote for her. She has nothing to play but the race card. That's the way that they roll. They break people into groups. They don't want people to see themselves as individuals. They try to break people into groups. And I think, as I've talked to many Democrats in the past, they really didn't understand that the difference was between consensual sex and rape. They thought that Bill Clinton was actually kind of cool for having a string of bimbos. He does have a string of bimbos, but he also has a string of victims. But I think those same people who cannot see the perjury that he committed, the lying under oath for which he was impeached, they cannot see the sexual crimes that he committed, those same people are going to look at this situation and say, hey, that's kind of cool, he's got a black son, he was the first black president. I think they're going to give him a pass. Stay with us when we come back, we're going to break more information about what Hillary Clinton was doing in Libya. It was actually a personal vendetta. We'll be right back. Tonight, as we just said, we're going to have a live event coverage of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks releasing what many believe will be the long-promised October surprise against Hillary Clinton. And in anticipation of that today, WikiLeaks put up a tweet. Hillary Clinton on Julian Assange, quote, can't we just drone this guy? As we point out in the InfoWars article, the Washington Examiner notes that during the same time, the State Department was involved in discussions on what non-legal methods were available to subdue Assange. This came out. Now, understand uh, what non-legal uh, methods they could use. Not non-lethal, but non-legal. You know, things like framing him in Sweden for uh, raping uh, two women simultaneously. They say the emails previously released from Clinton's private server reveal Anne-Marie Slaughter former director of policy at State Department, sent an email on the same day in 2010 on the subject of possible non-legal strategies for dealing with WikiLeaks. The email also notes that a meeting was held that day to discuss WikiLeaks. And as we've all seen, the uh, Fox News report, uh, Fox business commentator Bob Beckel disgustingly talking about, can't we just kill Julian Assange? And he wasn't joking, folks. You look at that clip, you understand. He says, a dead man can't leak stuff. He said, this guy is a traitor. He's not. He's not an American citizen, quite frankly. Uh, he's treasonous, and he's broken every law of the United States. I'm not for the death penalty, so, well, there's only one way to do it. Illegally shoot the son of a bitch. That's the way you deal with people when you don't like the free speech. That's the way you deal with people when they expose the crimes of our leaders. You call for their execution or imprisonment like they have done as well with Snowden. And again, when we look at this, uh, this article we had today, October 3rd from Paul Joseph Watson, an exclusive article, very detailed article uh, from an Indian uh, Christian uh, pastor who runs a uh, charity organization, Dr. K.A. Paul, talking about how he presided over negotiations to try to arrange a peace in Libya. Now, he was involved with General Wesley Clark as well as Representative Dennis Kucinich, and as he said, uh, when they worked through this, and of course he'd had experience counseling work with King Hussein of Jordan and with Yasser Arafat, he pointed out that they had an agreement and Hillary Clinton proceeded with this anyway. As he sees it from his perspective, this was Hillary Clinton's war. She bragged, uh, we came, we saw he died. And what's more interesting about this, he says it's well known that Libya at the time, that Gaddafi supported Obama over Clinton in the 2008 presidential race. Her representatives went to Gaddafi and asked for money. He refused her, and he subsequently died. 
As a result, a lot of people like the uh, $32 million that was subsequently paid to the Clinton Foundation by the Bahrain uh, people. Was that for access to Hillary Clinton or was it for protection from Hillary Clinton? It's his opinion, he says, that states like uh, Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates are all silently terrified at the prospect of Hillary Clinton becoming the next president of the United States. Anyone who doesn't want to see the United States turned into a RICO gangster organization even further than it is now should be very concerned about that prospect. Now, if we look at the types of tricks that we have seen in the past, we have uh, news that has surfaced uh, from RT. Pentagon paid a PR firm $540 million to make fake terrorist video. They say they paid half a billion dollars to create fake videos in Iraq. This is a secret propaganda campaign that's been exposed by the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. They say both the White House and General David Petraeus at the time, and of course this is the guy who shared classified information with his mistress, and of course got away with it as well, just like Hillary Clinton, signed off on the content that was produced by the agency. A former employee, Martin Wells, told the Bureau how he found himself working in Iraq after being hired as a video editor by Bell Pottinger. Within 48 hours, he said he was landing in Baghdad to edit content for secret psyops at Camp Victory. What did they do? Well, they created scripts and filmed uh, Arab uh, soap operas. Of course, we also have the CIA creating scripts uh, for American companies, don't they? Showing <laughs> the things that they want us to see. Showing the CIA, showing the FBI, always as the noble saviors of mankind, never as people who are setting up false flag events. The firm also created fake Al-Qaeda propaganda videos, he said, which were then planted by the military in the homes that they raided. So we have what is emerging, and we see continually from Hillary Clinton, a pattern of setting the world on fire, creating chaos, creating destruction everywhere they go. And of course, part of that is economic warfare. They not only have revived the Cold War, they not only have brought us to the brink of World War III, provoking Russia in the Ukraine and Crimea, as well as getting into Syria and Iraq, uh, fighting them as they're trying to fight ISIS and threatening to shoot down Russian planes, threatening to put in a no-fly zone. And of course, it was General Petraeus himself who just said last week, uh, we could do that. We could do that very, very quickly, at no loss to ourselves, because we could just use cruise missiles and other missiles to shoot down Russian and Syrian planes. Okay, yeah, there's some consequences that need to be thought about with that. But it's not just the two hotspots that have been created, the creation of ISIS out of Libya, arming and uh, starting the war in both Syria and Iraq, the revival of the Cold War in Ukraine. But it is also economic warfare that is now taking place between the U.S. and the EU in terms of our regulatory uh, punishment of their industries. Uh, we see now that Deutsche Bank is uh, having difficulty... Uh, presenting cash this last week. Now, they blamed it on an IT outage, but there may be more than that. What is this is shaping up to look like is a classic run on the bank. Why is this happening? Well, there is a pending $14 billion fine that America has slapped the German bank with. And understand that when you look at German banks, you can just substitute the EU itself. Now, this happened within just a couple of days of America... Uh, of, of uh, the EU, rather, uh, putting a $14 billion fine on Apple. And what is this fine on Deutsche Bank for? Is for activities that are about 10 years old, activities that predated the 2008 crash. So they waited for 10 years, and they did it a couple of days after the EU fined Apple, and they did it at exactly the same amount of money, $14 billion, $14 billion. And, of course, the Germans understand what this is. This is economic warfare. But it also shows us that the globalists are telling us, uh, that they say that if we have nationalism, we're going to have trade wars. That's inevitable. We're going to have that kind of competition. There are always going to be interests that are protected. What are the interests that are being protected? It's not countries now, but favored corporations. So the U.S. is fighting for Apple. Uh, the Germans are fighting for the protection of Deutsche Bank. And I think uh, prior to that even, uh, Volkswagen, the fines that were put upon Volkswagen. So we see across the board, Obama and Hillary Clinton shaking people down for money, starting wars to threaten people, creating economic warfare, which isn't supposed to happen with globalism, just as we were not supposed to have any more boom and bust cycles after we created the central banks, and yet we did. 
So this is happening across the world. And at the same time, we see an agreement this last week. At the end of the week, we were told that OPEC had agreed to cut uh, production so that they could increase oil prices. Oil prices have collapsed because the worldwide economy is collapsing. And because there is massive competition with Saudis domestically. Our domestic production has gone up. So they targeted fracking and other industries here in the United States uh, for competition. They thought they could drive them out of business by taking the price lower. So they maintained their production rates in the face of falling demand. And we have seen uh, oil collapse with that. And yet, what it looks like at first glance that they have thrown in the towel on this economic warfare, it turns out that may not be the case. We learned on Friday that it really wasn't an agreement, as this is pointed out by New American. It wasn't a, really an agreement to cut production. After all, it was an agreement that was hammered out after six long and reportedly testy hours between behind closed doors in a side meeting in Algeria to appoint a committee to study the matter and come up with options that the cartel will consider at its next meeting in November in Vienna. This is what is awaiting us in an uncertain world. This is why we need to be very concerned about what is going to happen to our economy and who is going to look after the interests of America and not after their self-interest. Stay with us when we come back. We're going to look at the collapse of our civil liberties. Stay with us. We'll be right back. I'm Margaret Hell reporting for InfoWars.com. We know that the president has said in his last couple of months of office he's authorized for the fiscal year a push of 110,000 Syrian war refugees. They're entering our shores at any time. The reason we're talking about this today is because that fiscal year started on the 1st. So at any time, Owen, we could see this going largely unnoticed by our media because we know that they don't have a tendency to report on any of this. And we're here to bring you the most up-to-date information that we can on this massive issue that affects you and I. Now, 110,000, you know, the, the argument on the left, Owen, is that that's not nearly enough. We know that if Clinton gets in office, she's promised to ratchet that up by as many as five times. We could see this massive push. But just on a, on a, on a local level for a second, the people that are entering these small communities, the, the communities aren't even properly vetted. They don't know that, that it's happening in some cases. And I know you're going to get into Hillary's plan. You know, I just wanted to bring this up to people because the first is, has come and gone. And at any time, we could start seeing these waves and waves of people entering small towns, coming to a small town in, near you. That's what we're looking at here. Well, it's interesting because the majority of Hillary's first year in office, it'll actually be Obama's plan. And if you look at the numbers here, Obama's plan has said it's going to admit 110,000 refugees. There's actually an article on the WhiteHouse.gov right now that breaks it down from where and what regions and the numbers. So for the majority of Hillary's first year, it's actually Obama's refugee plan. So Obama is going to continue his plan to bring in as many Muslims into this country even after he <laughs> is in office. So, but, but, but Hillary has said she wants to increase these numbers. This is what we're hearing from the left. I think that Hillary hasn't really put much time into a plan. She's been doing a lot of mm -hmm. campaigning, obviously, so who knows what her plan might be. But they do expect that her first term could bring as many as a million Muslims here mm -hmm. and cost the American taxpayers as much as $400 billion. Mm -hmm. We know that, uh, and we've you and I have covered this time and again here on InfoWars, that Soros... There is an agenda here. There's an agenda to override American culture and, uh, you know, to really see a surge, much like we've seen in Western Europe. And, uh, you know, having this issue where, uh, you know, immigrants, this immigration issue, it, it looks like Donald Trump has come to the forefront of this. He's speaking out and he's saying, look, we really don't have any proper vetting process. Uh, we, do, we don't have any way of, of tracking people once they enter the country. And DHS has even said, you know, once we vetted these people, they are cleared, free to go. They, they're holding the, the correct paperwork to enter. That They're on their own. They're not tracked or followed in any way, shape or form once they hit our shores and go through processing. You know, they, they have the same rights as you and I. And uh, they're also given help, aid, housing, food allowance, you know, entrance into schools, you know, health care, uh, these massive packages. And, you know, without very little question from ordinary citizens like you and I who really want some answers. You know, who are you allowing in? We know that point zero, even if it's only point zero zero one percent, have been radicalized and have the intent to harm. You know, you do the math, 110,000, what would that be? We're talking about even marginally people that are entering that want to harm us. So, and that's a great concern to me. Well, and just this morning, there was a hearing on C-SPAN where 
One guy got up there with intel that he knew ISIS was infiltrating the refugee program mm -hmm. um, with radical Islamic terrorists who want to come here and cause harm. And then the next guy comes up and says that we need to be tolerant and that there is no danger. I mean, it's shocking what's going on just, just within our own government on a day-to-day -day level. But, you know, here's the questions that need to be asked. Look at these numbers. Over 12,000 Muslims were brought in from Syria, only 68 Christians. You know, what's up with that? I mean, there's mm -hmm. clearly a discrimination there. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, you talked about it earlier. This is a culture war. Mm -hmm. If we let all these people come here, our culture is going to change. Now, we can debate whether that's good or bad, but this, these are facts. And as you said when we were off air, the power needs to be returned to the state level. But, mm -hmm. you know, here's where I see him going with this. If they give the power to the state level, what are we going to see? I think we're going to see something similar to what we saw in North Carolina, where North Carolina says, we want to have uh, gender bathrooms, male and female, common sense. And now what happens? Mm -hmm. They're having all kinds of backlash just for wanting male and female bathrooms. So now I could see uh, something happening where if states say they want to have a more strict uh, vetting process mm -hmm. or they don't want to allow Muslims into their state, whatever that state decides, the federal government will withhold funding mm -hmm. and, and, and certain corporations will not go there and provide more business to that state. I mean, and even for me, Owen, you know, this is an, an attack on, on, on Muslims. This is an attack on radical Islam and not knowing, you know, a people with an agenda, a direct agenda to harm you and your kids being allowed to walk the streets of your communities. And, oh, by the way, we're going to give them paychecks to do so. And going back to that point of returning power to the states, you know, instead of running, uh, you know, protecting the security and sovereignty of our people, People, you know, it, it seems like our federal government has been hijacked. And for me, the states have, they should have the power over that refugee resettlement issue because it's happening directly on their, you know, in their um, sovereignty. And it's very disruptive and disturbing. We wanted to bring this to you, Owen and I working on this report, specifically because we know that that October 1 deadline has come and gone. And at any day now, with little notice to you, there will be no fanfare, no media coverage of this. We don't even know how many at a time are coming. They will be entering our, our small towns and virtually virtually left once they arrive. Well, I'm Margaret Hall in studio with the talented Owen Schwarrier. Please stay tuned for more reports just like this and tune in to InfoWars.com. I'm Ashley Beckford reporting for InfoWars.com. As we know, guns are severely demonized in our society. In fact, Chris Hayes from MSNBC recently said that he was glad that the terrorist who bombed Chelsea did not have a firearm because the carnage would have been much greater. What a joke. As we know, we've seen so many incidences where people with Islamic backgrounds have been procuring firearms and then using them to inflict deadly carnage. They've been attacking people from San Bernardino, quote, workplace violence to the Orlando nightclub shooting hate crime. We have people all over the country and all over the world who are attacking people with guns. That's why I realized in order to be a true feminist, I had to learn to protect myself. In this uncertain world, I knew that I needed to take advantage of the Texas laws and go ahead and get my concealed handgun license and my license to carry by going ahead and going to Central Texas Gunworks. I met Michael Cargill. He's a friend and fan of the show. And it only t took one day, it only took a few hours for me to shoot a few targets. We went to a class uh, where we learned all about all the laws, what you can and cannot do when you're carrying your firearm. We also went to a shooting range. Fire. And we basically learned close range as well as long range gun safety and how to actually hit your target. So my point is this. When it comes down to it, an empowered woman has to know how to protect herself. Ready? Fire! One shot! Ready? Fire! People need to understand that the license to carry handgun course or conceal handgun license or CCW, whatever it's called in your state, you need to understand that that course is really not designed to teach you how to shoot. 
It's only designed to evaluate your proficiency. It's only designed to teach you the laws. So you need to take some other courses. You need to practice uh, how you're going to draw that gun from the holster if you have to stop that threat. It could be three o'clock in the morning where you have to jump up in the middle of the night and pull that gun out and stop a threat. If you do, you need to be proficient with that. It needs to become second nature. It needs to be, uh, you need to have good muscle memory. Three shots, fire! When seconds count and the police are minutes away, you have the Second Amendment there to protect you. Three armed attackers broke down the door to this woman's home at 4 a.m. They were brandishing guns. She exercised her right to defend her livelihood and her property, according to the local police department. Her home security cameras show her rushing from her bedroom and unloading her bullets on these attackers. And I commend this woman. Of course, it's a horrible tragedy whenever you have to take someone's life. But this woman is well within her rights. Some people think that it takes forever to take a gun class, but it actually didn't take a long time. It only took one day. And I'd like to know, do you have one day to protect yourself? Stay tuned for more special reports. The central issue for Donald Trump in this campaign, the one that began the campaign, is the issue of open borders. Now, this issue is going to be coming before the American voters in about a month, but it went before the Hungarian voters this last weekend. As The Guardian reports, Hungary's refugee referendum was not valid after voters stayed away. They point out that although 98% of the people voted to stop the open border situation, they only had 44% of eligible voters, according to their count, that showed up for the election. So constitutionally, the referendum is not valid. But think about that. 98%, the people who were interested enough to show up and vote, 98% of them said, we do not want to have the great people replacement. And that is precisely what is happening, folks. We need to understand what is behind this. We need to understand this is a tool of the globalists, a tool of the corporatist to take over our country, to create a great people replacement, to create a conflict of cultures, to create chaos, as they've done throughout the Middle East. Now, to give you an idea of how this is going to play out, let's take a look at a couple of lawsuits recently, a couple of disputes at different factories. Now, the first one uh, is goes back to January 28th, 2016. And this was uh, 53 Muslim workers in Wisconsin at a place that manufactured lawnmowers and snowblowers, okay? And the, both of these disputes are about unscheduled prayer breaks. Can they take Muslim prayer breaks and shut down the factory during the day? The Muslims demand that they be allowed to do this. And of course, we've had Bill Clinton go to Detroit and brag about the fact that we could bring in uh, Muslim migrants to rebuild Detroit. Hey, we got all these empty homes because Democrat policies have destroyed Detroit. They have destroyed the automobile industry. And so let's bring in people from Muslim countries and let's rebuild Detroit. How is that going to work? You know, what, what would Henry Ford do with his production uh, lines if people were to take the kind of breaks that they're talking about? What are they talking about taking? Well, they're talking about taking five 15 to 20 minute breaks per day. Think about that. Five 15 to 20 minute breaks per day per day, per workday. Now, the other place, before we move on, uh, there actually resulted in a lawsuit. This uh, first one uh, just happened back in January of, uh, of this year, January the 28th. This other one happened way back in 2008. There were 80 Somalis, uh, Muslims, at a meatpacking plant in Nebraska. They were fired in 2008 because they wanted to do this. Now, they, uh, they started a, a lawsuit two years later. So there hasn't been a lawsuit on the uh, Wisconsin case yet because that just happened in January. It took two years for the meatpacking plant lawsuit to be filed. Again, 80 Somali Muslims. These are the people. Remember Mogadishu? Remember Black Hawk Down? Remember the fact that there is a war going on in Somali between the Muslim Arabs uh, connected to al-Qaeda? And the black indigenous population there that is really sub-Saharan, uh, that's what's going on. That's largely Christian in that country. They're being slaughtered. Uh, but let's talk about this lawsuit. This was a lawsuit that was filed by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the government, against the factory, Swift Meatpacking Plant, alleging religious discrimination. And, of course, this is just for taking time off to do 
multiple prayers during the day. Uh, it's not saying that they can, uh, I don't know what would happen if the meat packing plant wanted to start packing pork, for example. Would these Somali Muslims be able to dictate to them that they would not be able to uh, handle any pork uh, processing? I don't know. But let's take a look at what this amounts to. In one case, we've got a meat packing plant. In another case, we have an assembly line for lawnmowers and snowblowers that is shut down. Think about how much time this is. If you've got 15-minute breaks, five of them during the day, which is what they're asking for, that's an hour and 15 minutes off of an eight-hour workday. What if it's 20 minutes, okay? That's an hour, 40 minutes off of an eight-hour workday. That works out to eight hours and 20 minutes a week. It works out to 33 hours and 20 minutes per month. It works out to 10 and a half weeks over the course of a 50-week year. Think about that. They're demanding that they get 10 weeks off so they can pray on the job. That's what that amounts to. Can you maintain a factory like that? No, you can't. That is the absurdity of what we're seeing. That is what is fundamentally beneath this clash of cultures. We have to understand that Islam is not simply a religion. It is also a culture, and it is a legal system. It is a theocracy. It is an intolerant theocracy. It is directed against the very same people that Hillary Clinton has carved out as her demographic base. Homosexuals and women. The Muslim theocracy has brutalized those two groups of people simply because of who they are. And yet these are the people that Hillary Clinton goes to for money on the one hand in the Muslim countries and then here in America, those same people who will be the single uh, most identified victims of a Muslim theocracy are the ones that she turns to for support, who blindly vote for her. What is America going to look like under Hillary Clinton? We're going to see more authoritarian policies, more violations of our individual rights and civil liberties than we have ever seen before. Take a look at some of the things that are coming out just in the realm of education. Just last week, we had Obama's education secretary saying that he is concerned about homeschooling. Why is he concerned about homeschooling? It's very touching, especially considering the fact that so many people who go to government schools come out functionally illiterate. Why would he be concerned about that? Well, he doesn't think they're getting exposed to a broad enough range of instructional experience. And, of course, this is a guy who is a Common Core activist. His name is John King. He said he was concerned some home-educated children were not getting the breadth of instructional experience that they would get at a traditional school. What might that be? Well, we got a glimpse of that this week. We see a Texas lawmaker, uh, State Senate Criminal Justice Committee Chairman, Senator John Whitmire out of Houston said on Thursday that he plans to file a bill that will mandate that schools teach students how to behave when they get stopped by officers for traffic violations or for any other reason. You know, you just want to stop people for stop and frisk or you just want to shake them down and see what kind of fines you can get from them. Well, you know, they need to be able to learn how to survive. They need to be able to learn the proper etiquette to submit to their masters. You know, we see that the police are there to protect and serve. Now they have made no bones about who they're there to protect and who they serve. And this is the thing that should concern all of us. He said, increased training and education for both peace officers and our students will help foster positive relations and interactions. They're not going to train the police to be less aggressive. They're not going to change their mission to stop harassing people for petty fines. No, they're going to teach your children to be obedient to them. Look at what's going to happen to transportation. We saw this last week. A Senate bill will mandate TSA involvement and surface transportation security. Understand TSA has been transportation. It didn't say anything about airports. And this is not even a Democrat. This is a Republican, Senator John Thune. And he used the opportunity of bombs being found near a train station. It only took him two days to go in and introduce this legislation. Because any threat, real or imagined or false flag, will be used to expand the reach of the police state. They say they're going to use the TSA to, uh, they're going to apply it to mass transit, to passenger rail networks, and to public areas of other transportation systems. Understand that as they try to move to autonomous cars, as they ban human drivers, they will be creating a security state around all movement. When you start a war against a people, one of the first things you need to do is control the means of transportation. And we know what the end game of this war is. The end game is Agenda 21, locking the people into high-occupancy 
small concentrated population centers in the cities. That's precisely what they're going to do. The way they're going to do it is with the roads, with the TSA controlling, choking off your transportation and your freedom of movement. And then as we look at the war on drugs, the United Nations war on drugs, because that's where it came from, folks. It was the United Nations that created it, not Richard Nixon. We have followed their blueprint. We have followed their agenda just as they have put out an Agenda 21 for our cities. In the war on drugs, we see the attorney general admits that pot isn't a gateway drug, but prescription pills are. This is happening at the same time that they are trying to ban another popular plant, the Kratom plant. And we've had reports about that here at Infowars.com as well. What is the competition to Kratom or what is Kratom the competition to? It is a competition to prescription drugs opioids okay very dangerous drugs that uh, they're try that they're incompetent to this is the issue that we're faced with well that's it for tonight's news join us tonight for the live broadcast of julian assange reveal we hope of hillary clinton